Good morning. Isn't God good? Come on, somebody. It's just so good, man. I'm just... You know, I think that... Uh, I don't know. I think some, sometimes in church we get so planned out and we get so worried about all the things that don't matter instead of the only thing that does matter is that his presence is here and we encounter him. And uh, man, I hope that, that you just sense God drawing close today in his presence and his realness. Um, got a few things before I get to the word. Uh, so I'm happy and excited to announce that we are ready to officially announce a launch date for Emmanuel Campus, okay? And so um, the, the, first of, the first weekend in November is when we're gonna launch. And so we're really excited about that. And so uh, beginning that process, and there's several ways that honestly, we just need your help. And so we're gonna have a church work day. Well, let me just say this way. You can text launch, make sure you spell it correctly because I can't spell. L-A-U-N-C-H, launch to the number 45,000, and this will give you all the information, but uh, we're gonna have a church work day. How many of y'all grew up having church work days? Does anybody remember that life, okay? Uh, one of the visions behind Open Door, and this has been a conviction of Lauren and mine over the last few years, and if you said this statement, please know I'm not, I'm not throwing shade for those of you who are above the age of 40, what that means is that I'm not disciplining you. I'm saying to you, one of the things that's convicted us is that we hear a lot in the community, you guys have a great church. And I just want you to hear me, it's our church and it's his church, it's not my church. And so one of the visions behind Emmanuel is that we do this together, that we repent as a church for just doing it for you. But church is something we are meant to do together. It's not an amusement that we come and participate in or hear. It's not a show. It's a thing that we do together. Can I get a good amen in this house? And so we're gonna have a church work day. There's ways for you to sign up, use your giftings and talents. Uh, we're gonna paint, we're going to do landscaping. We're gonna do all kinds of stuff. And it's gonna be something that we steward this property together. We're gonna start doing some of that here. We need people to help us serve. Um, and I don't need all the servers to leave here and go there. Uh, and so, you know, if that's what you feel called to do, then go for it. But I'm just, uh, we do need people. And, uh, and so please prayerfully consider about partnering with us to help us. We're going to have live growth tracks going on. Pray. I, I really don't believe the enemy likes what we're doing. So I really believe that he is obstinate to it. That's okay because Jesus has him under his feet and we as believers do also. But we could be covered in prayer and you can help us pray because this is a big moment for our church and what God is calling all of us to do. And then the other thing is I would boldly ask for you to give. Pray about how the Holy Spirit would lead you to give. Um, scripture you don't hear very much in church is, is that Paul speaks to it under the Holy Spirit. Don't give out of pressure. Don't give out of selfish motivation but give from a generous heart. And so my job is not to tell you what to give. My job is to point you to the Holy Spirit and say, hey, you ask him and then you give out of what God tells you to give. But I believe it's good ground and I believe that God is in it and uh, it's gonna be an exciting time. Also, how about those pirates? Come on, somebody. Two and O, oh, let's go. All right, and so we got by in Jesus' name, Old Dominion. You know, and at the end, I'm gonna pray against interceptions. I'm gonna pray against them in Jesus' name. <laughs> Except for us, all right? But it's gonna be all right. So grateful for that. All right, you ready for the word this morning? All right, um, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place. Lord, as we open your word today, may you convict our hearts. Lord, may it pierce our soul, dividing between our soul and our spirit. Lord, may you illuminate truth to us. God, we rebuke the voice of condemnation that the enemy would ever try to bring. And Lord, we eliminate any distraction. May we be focused on you. Father, every word that I say, Father, may it be from you and every word that's not, may it fall to the ground. We give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, title of this weekend's message as we continue our series on the glory is Death, Burial, Resurrection death, burial, resurrection. How many of you like the cross behind me? 
Um, so grateful somebody let us borrow the cross uh, that they're using it for a wedding later on this year but it fits so well after Miriam and Jacob spoke his name is Jake but I call him Jacob that's his biblical name um, after he spoke last week you know I really believe in a time uh, when a lot's going on in America that we as a church need to be tethered to some things in our history that remind us that we're part of a story that God's been building for thousands of years not just part of a country that's a few hundred years old. And there's some things that when we look at it, it reminds us of the family God's building and how important that is for a reminder in this day. And, and it really speaks to the series that we're in on the glory. I want you to see the, uh, the graphic that we created because we've been walking through the tabernacle and we're gonna continue that journey this week. And uh, the tabernacle is a beautiful piece. They, the team, I mean, the teachings have been awesome on the, the desire of God to dwell with his people. And last week, we just talked about the purpose behind the tabernacle. They did an amazing job. This week, we're gonna deal with the altar of burnt offerings. And that was the first piece when you walked into the tabernacle or the temple that you would see. And one of the things that, that I really talked to the team about when we started this series, and we were talking about this series, is I said, look, we can get caught in a lot of teaching which would produce dead religion instead of recognizing that everything in that place points to one person and his name is Jesus. So we can get stuck in an old system or we can realize that this system pointed to one person and his name is Jesus. And while there was an altar of burnt offerings in the tabernacle, the greatest altar that was ever built was this right here. And we can't forget that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for our sin. Now, here's the deal. What I want us to start with, though, in this series or in this part of the series is I want us to realize this because one of the most famous passages of scripture and, and one that we all know, pastors like to use scripture that everybody knows, <laughs> is John three sixteen. Does anybody know that passage of scripture? All right, so let's go through it. For what? Let me, let's stop, hold on a second, stop. I messed up. For who, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. Some of you are King James, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear them? The begotten that you got, yeah, that you got in there. They're like, I'm here, I'm here, Pastor. I got it. That's the only one I know. <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? That whosoever. Okay. What's really interesting is that when we really think about how God operates, he operates through death, burial, and resurrection. And it was God's love that sent the son. And it was Jesus' love. Listen, he loves you. But it wasn't his love for you that nailed him to that cross. It was his obedience to the father. Mm. And so we discover something about this God and what he desires because there's this really complex feeling when you look at the altar of burnt offerings and when you start talking about sacrifice because all throughout scripture, God says he doesn't prefer sacrifice over obedience. Let me show it to you because this is important. First Samuel, we're gonna get to the Bible. I want you to turn with me in a minute, but I wanna hit these few. First Samuel 15, 22. So Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying? Somebody say obeying obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Let me give you another and we'll move on. Micah 6, 6 through 8. It says, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
What God desires out of you and I is to walk with him. And listen, religion always thinks first about sacrifice where relationship with God guides me in obedience. Let me give you this statement. It is true that God desires obedience more than sacrifice. But most often, if we obey his voice, he will guide us to sacrifice. So God desires our obedience over sacrifice. But if we actually follow Jesus, most often he will guide us to a place of sacrifice. Now I was thinking, I was praying before I went away on sabbatical because uh, I dealt with three major issues and churches that I'm connected with and it had really grieved my heart what was happening in these churches and, and it just felt like God was, I don't know how else to say it, there was just a turning over of tables in the house of the Lord. And it feels like right now that not a month goes by that we don't have some major Christian leader come out in the news having fallen. It doesn't matter what movement they're a part of, whether it's non-denominational, whether it's part of a denomination, whether it's the prayer movement. It just feels like everywhere we turn, something is coming out. And I was crying out to God. I was like, God, what is happening why is this taking place? Some of these people were people I greatly respected. And I was like, what is going on? And the Holy Spirit, like many times he does, I felt like he reminded me of a story from about 25 years ago. And 25 years ago, I was just beginning to get in ministry. I'd started working for a nonprofit here in town called Hope of Glory Ministries. And that's kind of where I got my foot in the door and, and started discovering Jesus again after my crazy past. We don't have time to talk about it. You can look back at it. But I was a, I was a crazy sinner, okay? So when somebody had to say, what kind of background did you have? It was, it was a doozy. Some of y'all can, 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 can witness with that. Some of y'all partied with me back in the day, which is always fun to see you at church. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> Oh, the blood of my tea. I'm sorry. And, uh, and I was working for somebody I greatly respect still in my life today. He's actually an elder in our church. And uh, one of his things was that he wanted us to write thank you notes to anybody that gave to the ministry. And, and so he told me, he's like, hey, I want you to write these thank you notes. And, uh, and I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, I got it. And uh, a few days went by. I never assumed that he would ever ask again should have known differently. Uh, he comes up to me and he says, hey, did, did you write those thank you notes? And, uh, and I did what every guy who has good intentions trying to remember to do things, but I couldn't remember to do anything, said, yeah, I did them. Now, when I said that, that was a lie, okay? I admit it, but it was a white lie because I intended to do them. <laughs> it's a joke, guys, calm down, okay? And so I immediately, when I said it, I was like, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Has anybody ever done that? And I then started trying to justify in my mind how I was gonna get it done within 24 hours so it wouldn't be a lie. <laughs> and I went home that night and uh, I went to bed and I woke up and I felt terrible, Charles Barkley, terrible. And... Uh, and listen to me, what I've realized is not all the time when you wake up is it the enemy waking you up. Sometimes it's God trying to draw close. And so I woke up the next day knowing that I needed to do something, you know? <laughs> Confession to him was not in the, <laughs> not, I was not going to there. So I went to the next best thing, my priest, my dad. And uh, I called my dad and I remember, hey dad, you know, this is what happened and I'm, I'm confessing it to you. If you'd have ever known my daddy, <laughs> you would have known what he said. He said, why the heck are you calling me? <laughs> and he said, there's only one person you need to go talk to. And I said, well, that's stupid. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. And why? Because I respected this person and I wanted them 
I didn't want their opinion of me to change. And so eventually I called him and I remember the phone call, you know, kinda. I know he was gracious on the phone. But there was still this thing in me that I was like, oh, what am I doing? And I got up and I went to work the next day and he was there before I was there, which was up rare. I went up into my office and sure enough, he was sitting at my desk, which was disconcerting. And he said, come over here, son, sit down. And I went over there and he had his Bible open. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, Aaron, what you're feeling right now is the heavy hand of God. And how you respond to the heavy hand of God will determine the course of your life. In my prayer time, I felt like God said, Aaron, what you and the Church of America is feeling is the heavy hand of God. And how you respond to the heavy hand of God will determine the course of your life. In essence, what God, I believe, was saying to us and to open door to me, to all of us, is son, get on the altar. Get on the altar. Pick up your cross and follow after me. This is a moment that we believe. I believe with all my heart Jesus is coming back soon. I don't say that to scare you. I say that to reveal that man, Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. He's coming back with one that is not enamored with this world or not tied to it, but one that is deeply in love with him and realizes that he is our great reward. Not more money, not more fame, not more influence, not more status, but Jesus is our great reward. And there are so many people in our churches today that have not discovered that Jesus is actually that good, that he is greater than anything I can have have. He is greater than any fame I can get. He is greater than anything I have tasted when Jesus is the thing that we actually taste. Not religion. We discover that he is that good. That's our Jesus. But for us to discover that, we've got to be willing for him to burn up the things in our life that need to be burned up. Sacrifice without obedience is a payoff. It's a way around relationship. It's dead religion. It's lifeless practice. In reality, it is Catholicism or any other dead Christian practice and system built on anything short of his word and his voice. It leads to death because it begins in rules, not relationship. A great way to think about it is dead works leads to a dead heart. Like dead works, religious practice leads to a dead heart, but death to self, death to my flesh leads to an alive heart. And this is why we don't teach in churches anymore if we're not careful. We don't talk about this part. Oh, God wants you to have a blessed life. Yeah, but to find that blessed life, you're gonna have to say no to the life you think is better than him. Mm, I'm preaching better than you respond. Mm -hmm. If I choose what to sacrifice, I'm not following Jesus, I'm choosing myself. Mm, let's see that again. If I choose what to sacrifice, so if it becomes about life of sacrifice and not obedience, and I'm choosing I'm, I'm, I'm worshiping myself. I'm not worshiping Jesus. The only way to hear his voice is to be connected in and connected to his word. Listen to me, open door might not be the church for you, but please go to a church that actually opens the Bible and preaches the Bible. Don't go to a church that just talks about great topical stuff, but actually opens the word. Why? Because it's the declaration of this word according to Romans chapter 10. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith is the most contagious thing on the planet because when the gospel is spoken, then faith rises up in our hearts. 
What I'm saying is if you set your heart to obey God, sacrifice will be part of the equation. Jake spoke an amazing message last week, but I love what he said. He said, true worship confronts our flesh. It doesn't appease it. We were in Emmanuel for the first time as an all staff this past week. And oh man, we got in this moment of worship, sitting in this 75 year old building. We begin to sing, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. And what struck me is the words because we've gotten so good at music and moving people emotionally that we actually don't even have to think about what we sing anymore. And the problem is, is like, man, when we disassociate out of emotion from what we're actually singing, now emotion begins to guide our lives instead of the truth. That man, all to him. Some of y'all are like, what song is that? We're getting ready to sing it at the end of church today. You can find it on Spotify. It is still there. Some of y'all are like, I ain't heard that since the Billy Graham crusade. Well, we're bringing it back in Jesus' name, all right? Godly sacrifice is not absent of his voice. It's actually connected directly to his voice. It's deeply rooted in obedience. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Let's go to John chapter 12. And I am moving to move quickly today, but we're just going to, I just, the Holy Spirit's got it. We're going to do it, all right? You'll get out of here about 1030. Be fine. Some of y'all were nervous about that. I might have been serious. John chapter 12, 23. All right, love this passage of scripture. Some of you need to dig into this. This is a passage of scripture that when my dad died, he, he led me to, you know, I thought that he was dealing with my dad's death but I've come to realize over these last few months that it's actually what ministry is and it's what life of following Jesus is. John chapter 23 says, but Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come that the son of man should be glorified. Listen, really interesting thought, and uh, you know, really important I believe is, is that John, there is no doubt that John thought that Jesus was most glorified by the father not in his resurrection or his ascension, but in his death. It was the obedience of Christ that went to the cross that John was like, that was the moment that the father glorified the son because he was willing literally to die on the cross. Some of the moments that God receives the most glory is not in the burial and the resurrection, it's in us being willing to say no to our flesh. Listen to me, oh, this is good. I'm just gonna mess here now for a second because all oh, this is good to me right now. Mm. Some of us think God receives the most glory with how he uses us in our gifting. God receives most glory when we're willing to say no to our flesh. God doesn't care about a public display. He doesn't need it. He can show up where he needs to in spite of us. God cares about in your personal closet that you're actually willing to say no to you. Mm, amen, pastor, let's go. All right, I'm going to continue on because that's going over well. All right, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls, this is his proof, into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Listen, 25, this high bar. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be. And I will be also. And if, any, if anyone serves me, him, my father, will honor. Listen, the cross is essential to our mission and must be spoken about in our messages over and over again. It is not a symbol it is not an ornament. Listen, this is a lifestyle. This isn't something that, man, that, oh my gosh, please catch this. Jesus didn't die so that I wouldn't have to. Oh, listen, I am grateful that Jesus died for my sin. I couldn't pay that price. 
But Jesus didn't die so that I wouldn't have to. Jesus died so that then I could say no to myself and thus die daily. Jesus died so that now I can come to the place that I realize that thank you, Jesus, I've become awakened to my need for a savior and you paid a price that I could not pay. But Jesus, because you were that good, I will say no to me in my pursuit of you. Jesus died so that I could say no to my flesh. Jesus didn't die so we wouldn't have to. Jesus died so we could choose to die daily. Many of us like the teachings of Jesus, but we reject the lifestyle that Jesus calls us to. If God's voice led Jesus to the cross, then following Jesus will lead us to the cross also. Following Jesus will never allow me to bypass the cross, but rather calls me to the cross daily. I love this thought, the Christian life cost us much, but it's not something we can buy. To follow Jesus may cost you everything, everything. But listen to me, because he is worth everything. I'm gonna say it to this side of the room because they're thinking about it. It may cost, listen, it would be unjust, listen, for God in this pursuit of him to cost us everything if he wasn't worth that. And that's the problem with many of us today. We don't know that he is. He can, he can require anything because he's worth everything. And in that place, it becomes beautiful for us to realize of how valuable he is to our life. All right, I'm gonna invite Trey out because it's always better with a piano player and time is fleeting, but I have to get to this. Mark chapter 10, we're gonna look at this, all right? And we're gonna land this plane and I believe God's gonna do some amazing stuff in the next few minutes. Mark chapter 10, we gotta see this story because it's a story that, that, that we just need to catch in understanding this. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 talking about this verse number 17 it says now as he was going out on the road one came kneeling and knelt before him and asked him good teacher what shall I do somebody say do so listen he was thinking what do I have to do he was wanting what's the rule and he says though listen to inherit what Okay, so this is not, he's not asking, please hear me. He is not asking Jesus, what do I have to do to be a super Christian? What do I have to do to be better than everybody else? What do I have to do to be in the top 10%? He's simply saying, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? Huge statement. Jesus saying, why do you call me good? There's only one that's good. Verse number 19. You know the commandments, do you not? Com do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. And then he threw into the end, honor your father and mother. Can we get a good amen, parents? Come on, somebody. Yes, Lord. I'm going to remind my son of that. So he said all these things, do not do, do not do, do not do, do not do. And he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. So this young man, I mean, he, 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 he's doing all the right things. And then Jesus, listen to this, looking at him, loved him and said to him, Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, Jesus looked at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, Go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come take up your what? Cross and follow me. But the young man was sad at this word and he went away sorrowful for he had great possession. 
Listen, it's important for you to get some things. First off, I need you to know the context because this passage of scripture has been used to beat the hell out of people. First off, he is speaking personally to this young man, not corporately to us. So he's speaking to this young man and he's responding to a question that this young man had. He's speaking to the one thing in this young man that he knew would keep him from having a relationship with Jesus. Like Jesus looked at this young man and he loved him. And he does what only a savior can do. He looked into this young man's heart and he knew exactly the one thing that would keep this young man from coming to the place of Jesus being his savior. Jesus wasn't setting a bar for all of us. He was speaking to the one thing that held this young boy's heart. In our minds, Jesus is calling this young man to a radical pursuit of following him. Like it's really crazy, isn't it? Sell everything you have, give all your money away and come walk with me. But through the eyes of eternity, it wasn't even a question. What Jesus was telling him to do was minimal in what that young man would gain. What the young man thought brought him importance, significance, security, and freedom was the very thing that was actually holding him bound. In truth, what the young man thought made him valuable to the kingdom and to what Jesus was building was the very thing that was standing in the way of him discovering the king that Jesus actually was. With this young man, Jesus was simply eliminating the competition. What's holding you bound? What is it that God desires for you to lay on the altar? Is it money? Is it control? Is it a relationship? Is it a dream? Is it your time or your talent? When I was thinking this week, I mean, I know without a shadow of a doubt, God is absolutely trying to burn up pride in my life. I thought about healing and what God desires to do in this place and how he desires. But some of us are carrying so much resentment, bitterness, and offense that God can't heal. His hand is withheld from being able to heal us. And he's saying, will you let go of all that stuff? Have you discovered that I'm greater than any offense that you can have against man? That man, I am your reward. And if you'll get your eyes off of people and get your eyes on Jesus, then you'll discover that he really is that good. Jesus' answer to the young man's question isn't to cast out demons, is not to lay hands on him. It wasn't to pray it out. It was simple. Son, pick up your cross and follow me. I love the fact that he looked at this young man and the young man went away sorrowful and Jesus didn't chase after him. He said, oh, just kidding. That was my first offer. 50%. Oh, 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 a second, oh, a second. That's not good enough. How about 10? 10, 10%? Hmm. You see, Jesus isn't asking for a percentage. He's asking for all. Because for some of us, it's about our heart. It's never been. Jesus doesn't need our money. I don't know if you knew this, but the streets up there are in gold. You're not broke. It's always been about what's in our heart. What are, what, where are we at here? We love forgiveness and the forgiveness that he offers, but we cringe at the obedience that he actually requires. We need to be careful not to treat Christ or his gospel like a buffet when it comes to blessings and pass on the vegetables of hardship, suffering, and death to self. We desire the relationship, but we don't want to obey the boundaries he sets in place for us to accept for that relationship to exist. Listen, my concern, and I hope you hear my heartbeat, but more importantly, I hope you hear the heartbeat of Jesus. 
please church, please. I don't want religion. I don't want it. I don't want that ditch. I don't want us living lives where we just come in here and we sacrifice. I want you to know the voice of God. I don't want you to replace the voice of God with my voice. I don't want to be the one that tells you what to sacrifice. I want you to know deeply what it is to have really the knowledge of God, that you walk with him humbly, that you've discovered that he is that good. And can I promise you, if you go down that journey, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna discover that it leads me to this. That it leads me to say, God, burn up in me what needs to be burned up. God, listen, I think it is so much better to get on the altar than to be put on the altar. I think it's so much better to say, God, I want to come to this every day and say, what do I need to lay down? What's holding you bound? What's holding you bound? Please know, may we not be a bunch of young rich rulers. May we discover that man, he really is that good. What's funny in the verses after that is Peter, who's I was outspoken. He said, well, we're the best, God. We lay down everything for you. And Jesus said, man, no one has ever laid down anything for me. Then in the age to come, they didn't get back so much more. My brother-in-law this week, man, we've been going back and forth. And he just said to me, he said, to, in just a text, he said, Aaron, I'm finally discovering that Jesus is that good. He said, Jesus is my reward, not a promotion, not more money, not ministry. Jesus is my reward. Man, that's the gospel. That he's worth it all. And you can try to find it everywhere else, but it's in unfindable. So let me save you the time. He is that good. Can I get a good amen in this house this morning? Come on, somebody. Why don't we stand to our feet? Mary Beth. All right. This is the most important part of the uh, day. All right. And uh, so, so we're just going to stand and why don't you get your communion cup out? Let's go to the Lord's table. And I, I do, I think let's just start with all to Jesus, I surrender. Okay. Oh, man. And try, I know, I know, this is the most important part. I know, I know we got things to do, but I don't think anything is as important as him. So I want you to take the bread and I want you to remember that it was his body that was given. We don't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of his mouth. And so God, thank you for your word today. Lord, may it nourish us, may it feed us in the desert places. We give you glory and praise. Take and eat. And Lord, your blood. Oh, may we never lose wonder in the blood of Jesus. He cleanses us, washes us, brings us into right relationship with you. Jesus, thank you for the greatest meal ever served. Take and drink.